Hi everyone, we'll start in a minute or two. All right, I see uh, participants streaming in. Um, why don't we get started? Um, welcome to this special Pan Engineering event. And many thanks to Pan Wharton China Center for hosting us. I'm Bun Tao Lu, I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Professor at the Computer and Information Science Department at the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, our engineering dean, Vijay Kumar, who will kick off this event. Dr. Kumar has been our Pan Engineering Dean for over the past five years, and he has held numerous leadership positions at the school, including Chair of the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics, and Director of our Graphs Lab. So I'll let um, Dean Kumar take it from here. Thank you, Boone, and a good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to Pan at Work, Making Your Future. Um, as Boone said, I'm Vijay Kumar. I'm the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but I also have appointments in computer information science and electrical and systems engineering. <clears throat> a warm welcome to all of you, uh, alumni, current students, friends, and family of Penn Engineering. Thank you for joining us for this virtual event. I'm delighted to see so much interest. Um, I feel as engineers, uh, everybody in the US has a special bond with China. Why? Uh, for myself, I can just tell you that I travel to Beijing, to Shanghai and Hong Kong every year, typically in March and June. But of course, the last 12 months have been like no other. Uh, we're living the reality in the many different ways that the pandemic has changed the world. But thanks to technology, we're fortunate to be together in this virtual setting, however weird it might seem to you. And the silver lining here, of course, is that we're getting together as a large group. We're in different time zones. You didn't have to get up early or face the traffic that is uh, sometimes brutal in Beijing, perhaps in Shanghai. Uh, something we do in the real world, but in a natural setting, it's sometimes tougher. But in the surreal world we're living in now, it might be easier. Um, I mentioned earlier that I visit China every year. I do this for three reasons. First, from an engineering school standpoint, China has the largest alumni base for engineering students at Penn, next to the US, of course. And of course, we get the best applicants from China. Second, uh, the innovation in China, especially tech innovation. Tech innovation is exploding. I'm particularly a big fan of the, the triangle formed by Shenzhen, Shenzhen Dong Kuang and Hong Kong, an area that attracts so much talent, a trillion dollar tech economy with venture spending that are, I always say rivals what we have in the Silicon Valley and in San Francisco. Um, third, in my opinion, uh, China, of course, is the largest higher education system in the world. Um, so if you look at Chinese universities, Chinese universities have trained over 30 million students on its campuses. And it's trained and produced more than 60,000 doctoral students every year. So this is 2018 numbers. So naturally as Dean, as one of, one of the top US institutions of higher education, as a Dean of Engineering, to me, China holds a special significance. And events like this are a great opportunity for us to reach out to engineering colleagues, 
to engineering researchers, to engineering collaborators, and to students. Of course, engineering, I always maintain, is particularly important because it's central to confronting so many grand challenges that we face in this planet. Engineering is a catalyst for innovation in so many different areas. Human health, climate, food, urban infrastructure, and education. Actually, the list goes on and on. I've just mentioned the top five in my opinion. The lens through which engineers view this world is so invaluable to everyone, not just engineers, but people in different professions and different disciplines. Indeed, at Penn, where we pride ourselves as being a top engineering school in a liberal arts institution, Penn Engineering is growing faster than every other school. It's expanding in size in terms of the number of faculty, in terms of the number of laboratories, and in, of course, in terms of the number of students. We're expanding our footprint to educate and train students across campus and beyond, and reaching out to a more diverse, geographically diverse student body, not just on campus, but also online. But as we grow, we're mindful of the grand challenges that we face as citizens in this planet. We're growing in three strategic areas. First, engineering health. So any advance in health, health sciences or healthcare is essentially bootstrapped by advances in engineering. So we use engineering as an adjective to health. We engineer health. The second area of investment for us is data science. The idea today that a lot of commercialization, a lot of basic science, a lot of discovery, and a lot of education is driven by data-driven models, not just first principles, physics, chemistry, or biology-based models. And third, of course, and this is one of the biggest challenges that the planet faces, which has to do with the climate and related to that energy science and technology. So as a school, we're adding new positions to each of these areas, perhaps 25 new positions in the next five years. And we're building two new buildings uh, on our campus, one in the area of data science and the other in the area of energy science and technology. And today our panelists will tell you more about why these areas are so important in engineering. So whenever we talk about Penn and China, I think about it in two different ways. The first question I ask is, how can we get China to come to Penn? And of course, this happens very naturally. Chinese students come to Penn, they're among the top students and they're always welcome. Second, we seek out collaborations with Chinese companies, with Chinese universities. So that was the first question, how can China come to Penn? The second question is, how can Penn go to China? And of course, today that's very virtual, uh, but I hope in the near future, it'll be more than virtual, it'll be in person. But meanwhile, we wanna do this by strengthening the Penn Engineering Network in China. We want to make China an important part, maybe even a mandatory part of our education. We want every student at Penn to be exposed to Chinese culture, the spirit of innovation, the spirit of entrepreneurship. And we want to do it through coursework, through internships, through research collaborations. And events like this are really an important part of building this Penn China collaboration, the Penn China Network. Now, I must admit, if you're in China, you're probably thinking about the political rhetoric that you hear from Washington, D.C. and Beijing. In Washington, D.C., we appear to be opposed to immigration. But let me tell you that this is not true in the field of technology. In fact, in the U.S., I always say that immigrants, and actually I am an immigrant, immigrants have a higher rate of entrepreneurship than among US born citizens. This is a fact. If you randomly choose an entrepreneur in the US, the odds are that that person, he or she was once an international student. 
Indeed, you look at the CEOs of Google, Microsoft, Tesla, NVIDIA, they were once international students. So we at Penn are building and strengthening the connections with China. We're doubling down at a time when governments are not doing the right thing. So it's up to us, universities like ours, to step up and intensify our efforts to build this partnership. And today's event is just one of those events. And so it's through a very optimistic lens that I view the state of our school and our partnerships with China. And I hope you'll share this optimism. And I hope you'll join me in strengthening this collaboration. Let me st stop here and hand over control of the Zoom session back to my colleague and Associate Dean, Professor Boon Tao Lu. Boon? Thank you very much, Vijay, for this great overview of Penn Engineering and the exciting things that we could do together with our friends in China. Now for the audience here, if you have any questions, please at any point in time, use the Q&A feature to submit your questions on chat and we'll try to address them today. Now, without any further ado, we have a very special presentation by some of our Penn Engineering top faculty. With us today, we have Professor Jing Li, the Eduardo D. Glenn Faculty Fellow and Associate Professor in Electrical and Systems Engineering and Computer Science. We have Professor Jian Bo Xi, Computer Science Professor, and Professor Xu Yang, a Professor with Appointments in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, as well as Material Science. I'll be moderating this panel, and we will kick this off with Professor Jing Li. Okay. Um, thanks, Bon, for the very nice introduction. Um, 我是上海交大的校友。首先,非常感谢宾大沃顿中国中心的组织,感谢维吉和Bon的支持能有这样的机会和大家交流。Now, um, let's get back to my topic. Um, so, here are some uh, highlights of my uh, past research. Um, we are generally interested in a workload optimized system to meet the extreme performance or energy efficiency requirement of computer systems using, the, for example, finance by those Wall Street bankers or things for things like uh, high speed trading or supercomputers used to tackle the ground challenge, uh, uh, scientific challenges. So one of my uh, interests is machine learning system. Apply machine learning to drive more intelligent computer system, which can in turn can be used to derive more powerful machine learning models. So we have a new research community uh, recently formed called machine learning system with a very strong uh, industry support. So with this AI for system driving better system for AI, oftentimes people thought, uh, we are uh, building a Terminator, a Skynet type of machine. So next, I will uh, briefly talk about uh, the uh, fortunes that is pretty much uh, motivate our research. So the first trend uh, is recognizing the growth hardware software gap. So this is a famous chart that AI people use to illustrate the computation requirement to train the state of the art deep learning model over time. So the slope is, uh, the growth rate is a 35X every 18 months. On the other hand, if we look at the computer hardware, the growth of the computer hardware is pretty much bounded by the Moore's law, 2X every 18 months. So the growth in hardware cannot keep up with the uh, computational demands of uh, software application, especially in the era of AI and big data. To reduce this gap, in addition to CPU, GPU, there are many PUs out there. As you can see, in recent years, there has been an intense computation to develop AI chips across industry. 
including tech giants, Google, Microsoft, Huawei, Alibaba, all traditional IC vendors like uh, Intel, NVIDIA, numerous startups. The second trend is that for many applications in today's data centers, we are packing more and more hardware physically in a single machine. What used to be close to the computing capability of 20 machines a decade ago, now fits into a single machine in many data servers. The key challenge is how can we use this single machine effectively? One of the big aspects in academic or industry, both in de deployment and research, is that people are very heavily focused on skill out by simply adding more machines that we are not looking at, are we scaling in well to maximally explore the performance out of a single machine? So in, in my opinion, we need both. The third trend is a significantly increased complexity for designing computer systems. Data scientists and machine learning researchers and practitioners has been playing a catch up game to the changes made by the hardware architects. Whenever there's a change on hardware, they will modify their algorithm, rewrite their software implementation. Looking into the future with a significantly increased design space in hardware and software, the game of waiting for architects to give new hardware feature and then the machine learning folks reacting to it is no longer sustainable anymore. Since architecture is now at a crucial point where radically different architecture are now being invented as we shown before. So it's, it's becoming a chicken egg problem. Finally, the last trend is about the semiconductor technology. The end of CMOS scaling forces us to look into beyond the solid state physics to explore new computing capabilities, new electrical, mechanical, optical, bio devices, quantum devices, et cetera. So with this motivation to address those challenges, um, this bring us our research into two directions, pretty much focusing on everything around the data. How do we store data? How do we move data? How do we process data? So from top down, we introduce a concept called the data-driven hardware-friendly algorithm design. We aim to design algorithms to account for both the characteristics of the data and the feature of the underlying hardware. So that by design, it will be efficient even before deploying in a real system. We specifically focus on three areas, search, graph analytics, and machine learning. From bottom up, to support efficient data processing, we rethink a computer system design with data as a first class citizen and develop methodologies and mechanisms for both scale in and scale out systems. We show a synergistic and collaborative way of optimizing algorithms, software, and hardware can achieve significant improvement over state of the art industry solutions. Finally, in addition to systems optimized for machine learning, we also apply machine learning to further improve system, which can help to develop a more powerful machine learning model to perform the positive feedback loop as we shown before. Finally, um, based on this research method, I would like to highlight some of our uh, past achievements. Between the machine and the human brain, there's a five orders of magnitude efficiency gap. So how do we get there? The first milestone is a demonstration of the most performant deep learning accelerator on FPGA. According to the chief architect from leading industry, we set the world's record and we have been holding this record. The second milestone is a demonstration of the most energy efficient computing platform for data intensive supercomputing problems. It is ranked number one on the Green Graph 500 list, which is used to rank the energy efficiency of supercomputers worldwide. The third milestone is a demonstration of the first low latency bidding scale search on FPGA for building next generation search engine. 
saving hundreds x more energy than state-of-the-art industry solution. Finally, looking 10 years ahead, we also worked on more aggressive solutions and explore new physics to do computing. A project called Liquid Silicon, supported by DAPA, we demonstrated the first non-conventional post-silicon chip for general purpose computing with full system support, achieving computing efficiency closer to a human brain. Um, this is my last slide. Um, 最后给大家, uh, Thank you very much, Jing. That was a really um, exciting presentation. Uh, I'd like to pause for a minute while uh, Professor Jianbo Xi gets set up. Uh, if any one of you have any questions, please don't be shy. Type into the chat box or you could unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, uh, and we can also defer questions to the end. Right, I'm going to hand over to Professor Jian Boshi next. Thank you, Bo. Uh, can you guys see the slide? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, uh, I'm uh, very happy to be part of this panel today. And thank you, uh, VJ, uh, Dean VJ and Dean Vice Bo, uh, Vice Dean Bo, for organizing this event. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to 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 this come to the panel. Uh, every time I, I have uh, been part of this, uh, I always remind me that Penn has been a very uh, open university uh, to engage uh, across the, the countries, particularly China. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of this team. Uh, and uh, I hope one day we will get to see each other in person again soon. Um, so I worked on computer vision. I have uh, just realized I've almost been Penn for 20 years now, uh, time flies. And uh, when I first came to Penn, actually VJ was the head of the grass lab. And uh, we have a dream that one day we will build this robot that goes out and do many of the things. Uh, and uh, many of the dream actually, uh, I thought never would happen. But VJ had leader charts and uh, VJ's robots and drones been flying. Um, uh, we're very fortunate to be part of this uh, deep learning uh, revolution in the last uh, six, seven years that really transformed the way uh, computer vision had worked. So uh, I just want to show you maybe a few uh, slides and videos of things that's already happened in the last uh, year or so. The technology are moving really at neck breaking uh, speed. Today, for example, you can even uh, take uh, any 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 students, even high school students, could even build a system like this, uh, taking some of the off-the-shelf components. For example, you know we can detect uh, objects uh, at a, you know thousands of categories of objects, label them, and here I show the segmentation of this uh, object: the cats, your petting the pets, tracking your hands. Uh, you know here, showing another examples of uh, video being processed. Uh, object being detected, segment precisely hands. It might look very simple to you. Um, any kids could do it. But to me, this is a, a quite amazing because when I started 20 years ago, I didn't think, you know, 20 years later, I would able to get here. And this is what the, the technology had lead to us, right? So we are uh, be able to uh, process videos, uh, extract lots and lots of information, and maybe understand activity from this. Uh, this is all open source. And uh, you know, I encourage too many of you to download this code and run it. Um, so here's yet another in indication of the system running. Uh, I know you know this is actually lots of video coming from the internet. Um, much of the development is actually driven by people willing to share medias online uh, on TikTok, you know, on social medias, and so on. All these videos are being uh, put to use. I was just reading the news today uh, that Facebook had came out the software which learn through a billion images without any human intervention, uh, just by looking at the billions and billions of images a day is acquiring this type of outputs. And this is truly astonishing. Um, so not just only uh, we can detect and track objects, here we see that we actually can uh, find single image or video stream of image, just one camera, we can uh, predict the three dimensional 
shape of the objects uh, and color code them in terms of that's how far it is. Here, the brighter objects are closer to us, the dark things are further. Uh, this is almost to the level uh, of uh, human vision, but I would say it's to have some distance to go. Um, and not only detect 3D shapes, we can also you know, construct three-dimensional human shapes. And human is probably the most important part of the engineering system uh, to understand how human behave is probably the most important thing as we build a self-driving cars uh, or have service robot that need to interact with people. Technology today uh, mature to the point we can not only detect you know, the body signal out, we actually can compute the three-dimensional volume shape and so on. Um, much of the progress really is coming from, uh, I think, the idea that there's lots of data come in. Uh, Dean Vijay mentioned that this data science is the big revolution in the last few years. Indeed, there's lots of data comes in. Uh, one of the uh, scientific hurdles uh, that still remain to be solved is how do I uh, extract those information from the data with as little human intervention as possible. Today, AI system is still fairly expensive and still uh, fragile in the sense that it needs human uh, going to the pictures, tell us what's important in the picture. And much of the progress in the last year or so, um, I say last year, so I'm, in my mind is flushing thousands of papers being published during that duration of trying to break through that barrier of uh, limiting factor of using human labor as a, uh, as a primary source of uh, learning. And many people are working today of how a computer can learn on its own. And as I mentioned, there was some latest result just came two days ago. And this is my research, mostly focused on a wearable camera system that we can wear on our head. Uh, and just by wearing the cameras and watching how we interact with the environments, we can extract information without any supervision from a, a user. So here we're looking at a basketball game. we look at how humans are interacting with each other in the game and learning uh, the attentions in the social sense of who's looking at who, who's collaborating with who. And then we're also trying to use the vision system, not only of passive observation, uh, but also as a prediction of the futures. Okay. So we have been working on this area for several years now. Uh, today, we have a system that can uh, almost read your mind. Uh, when you look at a picture like this, it will tell you, you'll probably look at a mirror, you're probably cooking, uh, or you look at a poster. Uh, this is a camera that mounts on the top of your head uh, or wearable cameras. And the system without any training was able to kind of segment out and detect objects uh, in the scene. Uh, so these people can ask, well, it could be useful. It could be used for, for example, document your day uh, and summarize what's uh, happened in your activity. Maybe remind you, maybe you forgot something. Um, and uh, we also showed the system had been useful for animals as well. So animal cannot talk. But if you put a cameras on animals, you can almost read the animal's mind, uh, try to think what he's paying attention to. Uh, we also have been working on this idea of wearing a camera on your head, allow you to kind of understand how you might interact with your environment. Here we're looking at how you might walk into a space. Uh, this is a, you know, what I call this uh, self walking, not self driving, but how you walk into a scene. Um, and we have built a system that allowed us to look at footages of your self uh, wearable cameras using your past walking history to guide you how you walk in the future. So on the, on the left is the trajectory that from the past experience we have seen. On the right is the prediction of all the future trajectory you have seen. So for example, you can walk straight, you can go into somebody's home. Uh, I guess and this is the street in Philadelphia for people who have been to Philadelphia campus. Uh, many of my students jaywalk, so he decided to jaywalk between cars. Uh, indoor scenes are tough. One of the hard thing about indoor scenes is trying to understand where are the exits. Uh, exits are not always smart, uh, but from the contextual information in the past history, we're able to infer uh, where the exits are and how do you get into the store and how might you avoid obstacles around you. Uh, we've also been looking at physical constraints. Uh, for example, here's the self uh, wearable cameras. Uh, just by a camera wearing on you, uh, knowing maybe some basic factor of how, how, how much you weight, we're able to invert the physics uh, from the video, not just estimating the geometry, which is shown on the right, but also we can estimate the force in terms of Newton's friction and control uh, that you have uh, exerted on the bike, on our body. 
So this is exciting to me because we're gonna finally close the loop maybe from vision to robotics to control. Um, just gonna skip some of that video. Uh, those are mesmerizing to watch and there are many, many of those videos online. Um, and I think this is a very rich source information for uh, sort of taking a big data point of view, but without any supervision. Uh, I might want to just end up very quickly uh, and a new topic that we're working on, so-called curiosity learning. Um, and we have seen many forms of learning supervised, which is a label-based. Uh, we have seen uh, reinforcement learning. That's a, a term that talk about robot can learn through rewards. Uh, but we know that you know humans learn through playing around. When we are babies, we don't have really concrete rewards, but we play, uh, have a sort of curiosity-driven style learning. And, and we are trying to mimic this type of thinking uh, in this research project called a curiosity driven uh, thinking. And one of the particular uh, sub, uh, sub topic we're working on is called affordance. Uh, affordance is basically an idea that uh, uh, elements in the scene uh, can lead to certain actions. Uh, we don't randomly explore actions. Uh, we explore actions that pl are plausible, right? So for example, this monkey saw a blueberry in front of him he know that blueberry is reachable. Uh, so therefore he used that signal, visual signal to guide the sort of action he can take. And you might also see the apple. Apple is not directly reachable, but he knows if he walks uh, through the branches and if he tuck on the leaf, he can grab the apple and reach it. Right? So what we want to do is to learn the plausible actions, uh, give an image you have that lead to your actions. So this is the goal. And we have a technique we'll call uh, learning affordance by observing other people's success. So the main idea is that we've seen people succeeding in life. Um, many, many photos are taken, all showing success stories, right? Things have been happened in good ways. We don't see failures in the video as much, uh, which is the human nature, but we can learn from that, right? So for example, we've seen a person uh, sitting on the bench uh, through the computer system as shown earlier, we can segment the persons out, okay? So we, we take him out. And we can impaint. Uh, all the magic are, are available today. Now we know a, a picture of him uh, before he sat on the bench, and we know a picture of him sitting down. So now we know how he could sit down and what his body pose looks like. Uh, we call this also time travel, basically going back in time and figure what was before and what's after. But compare the difference, we can learn uh, from the data uh, how things could happen uh, in the space. So here, for example, we learn from the image where a traffic sign could be placed, a car that looks like this, where it could be driven on the road, a person uh, walking, where it could be on the space. Uh, we can use that technology to do many things. Uh, all of them are essentially uh, very heavily on, depends on the ability to use the current system to kind of detect a segment, uh, delete them and fill in the blank. Uh, with that, we're able to reverse in time and figure out where it is, for example, a person could be, um, and this is our results versus some of the competitors and can show that we are much more diverse and uh, give you a more plausible locations with those objects. Uh, maybe I should uh, kind of quickly wrap it up. Uh, this is for humans. Uh, for example, if I show you a ball, uh, showing a background image, uh, I can predict what the human pose looks like. I show you a bike, uh, you can you know, imagine what a person could be doing on, on a bike. Um, we also are working on uh, robotics related projects. Given a picture like this, uh, we are trying to predict where objects could be placed, uh, what three dimensional location could be. So with that, I think I just uh, end here. Uh, this is a very quick summary of some of the activity we're uh, working on here at Penn. But as I said, I always uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in China and I hope uh, we'll get to see each other soon in physical forms. Um, Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, Jenbo. I always love computer vision talks. There's so many nice pictures that are uh, very captivating. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So as, as our third uh, speaker, we have Professor Xu Yang, uh, and I'll, I'll let her take it from here. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Xu Yang, uh, Yang Shu. Uh, 原来是在复旦大学毕业, so my, today, my topic is programming materials uh, with intelligence, sustainability, and relevance. So why we're interested in these topics? So first, let me introduce myself a little bit. 
So I'm a professor in the material science and engineering, and also have a secondary appointment in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Because I have very broad interests, so I have I've been as a, in the graduate group in physics and astronomy and electrical and system engineering. Before I came to University of Pennsylvania, uh, I was a member of technical staff at Bell Laboratories, uh, used to call U Lucent Technologies. Uh, so my research area is very broad, but in general is in the soft and bio-inspired materials. So that include the polymers, uh, materials, gels, colloids, liquid crystals, amphiphils, and composites. So these materials indeed are uh, available and very visible in your daily life, such as all these protecting, personal protecting equipments. Now we're using all these plastics are part of the polymers and biomaterials gels such as gelatin and colloidal particles such as the jewelries and the paint, liquid crystals. Indeed, everybody use them in all different displays. And amphiphils are, for example, soap bubbles. And so I work on all these different kinds of materials, so-called soft material. And oftentimes I, I put them together and so so-called this composite material. And also I work on the soft and hard, putting them together to introduce additional functionality and also the performance. So having these very large library of the material, our question is: how can we do with them? All right, how do we make them intelligent, sustainable, and relevant? So the first question we asked is. What kind of problems do we want to solve and why? And what are the scientific impact? So that's as academia, we want to train the students to do research, to teach them, give them the tools. And when we do research, we want to ask questions, what is the scientific impact? On the other hand, we're training the students going towards the society and going to work in the companies, working in uh, universities and working in different kinds of industries. So the scientific, the social impact is also very important to us as a material scientist, I'm sure many of our engineer uh, colleagues. So as a material scientist, we look at is, is if I have this tool scientific understanding, how do we apply these material science engineering solutions to, to apply to, to solve the real problems? So to solve these problems, we ask what kind of performance we wanna achieve? And what unique physical properties do we want to tailor? So we can tailor mechanical, thermal, optical, electrical, surface properties, and so on and so forth. And after we have a goal, and how do we achieve the goal? So that's our approach. So how do we process those different kinds of material? So if I process material, how do I know they actually work well? So we need to characterize them. So that's a part of the material science is we develop a new chemistry, we generate new material, we care about the structure property relationship, and then we can generate new performance. So we ask the question is, are they novel? Novel in a sense is that may not be existing in the current uh, market. Can we create a new material, new structure, new devices? On the other hand, when you're producing the knowledge, when you're producing the product, they have to be relevant to what people are interested in. So we, we ask for the relevance. So in the meantime, because we have so many different kinds of materials, many different applications, and we ask is how do we be open-minded, especially in the university, is how are we being open-minded and work together and be collaborative? So in this aspect, in particular here, is we're talking to US-China relationship and talking to our alumni, we need to think locally we work together with our colleagues. On the other hand, we need to think globally, what is the potential impact? What is impact of te technology? And how do we bring the interaction and the collaboration concept and work together? So what are we interested in? What we are interested in is engineering functional materials and materials towards devices from nanoscale to macro scale. So here I give you several examples my group is interested in. As thing, uh, Kumar was talking about earlier, and how do you address, for example, the climate change? How do we address water, food requirements or the need versus the energy resource scarcity? So what I'm interested in is develop this kind of energy efficient coatings 
So whether we use this coating to mimic the butterfly in the nature to provide so-called structural color, repel the water, or use different kinds of geometry. So this is a pyramidal uh, structures using the geometry actually efficiently collect the water and guide the water and such that we can use the fog water or use the humidity water, the atmospheric water, and then going back, we can put these things onto the building and collecting the water and self-supporting our water usages. We can also apply these water to agriculture purposes to generate for the smart farmers. So that's one of the areas we're looking at energy efficient coating. Taking this knowledge of water and the coatings, we can also apply this knowledge to so-called this connected inter intelligent medical devices. As we know, in the medical devices, we need to have, for example, is how do we introduce sensing bio sensing biomarkers? How do we make them connected? How we generate data? How we use the data? So we interesting microfluidics and doing the biosensing. We look at, for example, the colorimetric sensing, such as it's intuitive to your eyes to recognize them. On the other hand, many of the devices has to be put on the body in a sense is wearable. So how do we make this device to be typical, oftentimes is hard materials, hard devices, silicons, how do we make them actually conformal to the body? And so that's another area we're looking at conformability. So speaking of the wearable, so we're generating another type of wearable is small wearable, it's textile based wearables. So as we know, the textile-based material putting on the, on the body is very comfortable because they're breathable and they're stretchable, they're conformable, but we want to add additional functionality. For example, they can change color depending on glucose concentration change, depending on body temperature change, they generate different colors. So this will be used for the visual recognition. So they can change the color to indicate the UV intensity, or they can be, for example, this is electrical devices, no matter how you wrap around on different um, body parts, they will not change the, uh, the electrical signal. And on top of this is we also work with robotics people, uh, such as in the grass lab, uh, Vijay is, is in, is to look at how we interface the soft and hard material. And so giving the robot the, the appearance as a soft, on the other hand, achieving what human cannot achieve by using the hard material. All right. So when we look at this, the other area we're interested in, we're interested from nano to macro scale, but on the other hand, can we take this knowledge and translate them to the human scale? That's why we're interested in working with the buildings. So can we introduce interactive building and the communicating the building and can we introduce the geometry to create so-called this uh, um, the envelope on the building? So we make the building smarter and they can change color, they can shed in the load, so we can make them more energy efficient. So speaking of this, one of the interests I have is to learn from the mother nature because mother nature is a wonderful material scientist and particularly they have so many strategies using billions of years of evolution, they learn how to utilize energy resources at the minimum. At the same time, she's maximum performance. So our interest is can we learn from the nature how they harvest the water, how they interact with light, how they use the heat, right? So we can generate the materials so to address the climate change and sustainability. At the same time, can we make the building where we live is to be as plant such as, oops, so I'm being too fast as this uh, flower, so flower can open and close and building can open and close. And so in that sense, a building is not static, but it's more interactive with environment. So to do so, we ask the question is, can we use environmental sources, resources such as water, like heat to help us to do the work? Can we learn from biology for its structure and function? So we make new materials, new devices, generate new algorithms, create a new manufacturing processes using sustainable, scalable materials such as cellulose, such as silk, bio-based materials. Can we use off-shelf material, give them new life? Can we make them so-called circular thinking materials, not only just recyclable, but also can give them reusability and the reprocessability. And in the meantime, achieve superior performance. So these are different examples of the materials innovation in my lab, where, as I mentioned, we're interested in coatings, we're interest, interested in uh, responsiveness, 
or interesting interface uh, interfacing uh, the synthetic materials and biomaterials. And we're interested in uh, looking at the nanoparticles and wearables. Uh, so these are different areas in terms of application we're interested in from energy storage to smart windows, to sensors, to adhesive wound dressing, biomedical devices, and, and so on. All right. And so last thing I want to mention is everything we're doing uh, research-wise, we need to connect them to the society. Uh, so that's why in the pandemic, we started to work on utilizing our materials knowledge to pr uh, provide, for example, origami mask to address the PP shortage uh, during the pandemic early years, early days. And uh, the other thing right now, we're trying to, to create fabric masks such that they're more efficient, at the same time washable, still achieving uh, the, uh, the filtration efficiency, and at the same time catching the, uh, the viruses preventing them going outside of your mouth or preventing other people's uh, virus from coming to your face. But as a researcher, as an academic uh, educator, uh, it's very, very important, dear to my heart, is we need to train the next generation. So all my research we're doing, we always, always connect to uh, outreach to kids, K-12. So from kindergarten to uh, the high school. And in addition, we work with undergrads and the graduate students and trying to uh, train the next generation workforce. So that's my interest uh, in terms of the material research from intelligence to sustainability to relevance. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, again, last thing is, uh, All right. Thank you, Xu. That was a very inspiring talk. Uh, um, if for any of the audience, if you have questions, please type them into the chat box. And I, I saw some activities in the chat and I'll be happy to um, repeat the questions for, for um, the, the, the panelists and then we can um, discuss them together. Um, so as Shu, as I was uh, listening to Shu's talk, I was, um, before that, I came up with some questions and actually her talk addressed both of the questions. Uh, but one of the things I'm very curious, and this is for all three panelists, um, Jing, Jianbo and Xu, is now the last year obviously has been very challenging with COVID, but how do you see your research in your community evolve, right? Some of the research opportunities or new directions that has emerged over the last few months because of the pandemic? And um, any one of you can take that question. So, so definitely I, I was driven by what we can contribute uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so last uh, March, we started to close down the buildings. And, and so, so my student and, and I, we, we brainstorming, what can we do, right? So naturally, because we're working on the polymers and the, the mask is, one of the masks is polymer, polypropylene. And so we're trying to understand the mechanism and, uh, and see how we can fabricate the masks uh, to address the shortage. In the meantime, is not everybody is required to wear the mask. Um, so our question is how do we make them more comfortable at the same time uh, achieving the filtration efficiency? Uh, so, so, so that's definitely the new area where we're getting into this. And then we initiate a new collaboration with dental school to look at a personalized 3D printable uh, face mask. And now we're talking to um, and additional uh, bioengineers and medical school people talking about how do we introduce sensors, the COVID sensors or other type of VOC sensors on these masks. Thank you. Jing or Jimbo? Yeah, actually, uh, I think this is a lot to do with not just research. Um, I think uh, last year has been extremely challenging uh, as university, a lot had to do with education itself. Um, and, and I think I actually, Boon yourself had to thank you for you know, creating this online master program, which brought in students from all over the world. And it's been a big challenge for us to kind of think about how to uh, reach out to them. And, and that platform you know, has been very useful for, for me to think about uh, integrating research and education in a more systematic way. Uh, we used to think research is research, education is education, but as we move online, both for research and education, 
uh, we start seeing uh, synergy between the two. Um, and uh, the last year also I've been kind of working with uh, PWCC for uh, online summer camp for high school students. Uh, and I was very uh, moved in fact by uh, many of the students who, you know, have willing to take a chance with us uh, to try out as a guinea pig, how do they learn online uh, 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 summer camp uh, with a uh, pretty advanced AI technology or computer programming. And Shu actually came over and talked about making masks. And uh, I, I was very moved uh, by how, how dedicated students were uh, and engaged in this platform. Um, so uh, I think, you know, once we feel comfortable with online um, and we can uh, have a bigger impact, I think reach out to a bigger population, broader audience. Thank you, uh, yeah. Jean, go ahead. Yeah, I echo um, well with what Jian Bo and uh, Shu has mentioned just. So I saw the last year the pandemic is a hard time, um, not just for our doing research and also for has influenced largely for our teaching. Um, so for, for, the, um, for the course, that we have traditionally uh, instructed, uh, which requires students to access a physical lab and a physical uh, computer uh, computing board. And right now, like uh, we have been moving everything to the cloud. So we have using a state of art uh, cloud infrastructure uh, for both allow students to do research and teaching. I have students in China and, uh, you know, uh, and I also have students do in China in doing research as well as, um, as well as uh, having a class, taking a class with me. So uh, with this uh, cloud infrastructure and uh, um, you know, it's uh, make it uh, easy for, uh, for students to, um, to learn uh, remotely. Uh, and also uh, from research side, uh, um, it's also raised uh, interesting questions. So for uh, our today's data center, uh, how do we architect uh, you know, the uh, data center to have a better um, scalability and elasticity um, to handle this uh, dramatically increased uh, workloads all of the sudden everybody going online. Uh, so um, this opens up uh, new challenges for us. Thank you, Jing. And I'm happy to see there are two questions in the chat. The first is a question by Wei Sun. I think he's uh, probably addressing this to uh, Jian Bo about uh, curiosity learning potential applications in the gaming industry. And um, can it apply to AI driven storytelling like the one in Westworld? Uh, maybe for sure, but maybe for me also. Uh, yeah, I think uh, QRC learning is a new form of uh, paradigm for learning. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, sort of trying to create a system uh, that can be task agnostic. So I think in terms of specific games, AIs are very good at it. So if you train the neural network on any specific game, you will find the loopholes in any game, uh, and uh, whether you like or not, it will beat every human being. But we can come up with more gains every time. So this is arm race. Curiosity is basically a technique. It's not trained for a particular game. Uh, it's trying to figure out uh, how to learn on its own um, without a external feedback and say you're doing great. It's basically constantly looking for uh, sort of inconsistency in prediction of future. Um, and with that kind of paradigm, I think. Uh, the robot could uh, lead to a sort of less a bias in terms of uh, what it learns. Um, so it's not just going to learn a loophole in the, playing the game, but actually maybe learn how to play the game uh, well on its own. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah. Thanks. Shu, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> All right, so so I can only say is my my son loves playing games, and uh, so we're trying to bring him to the reality. It's bring the physical science part of, uh, so playing the game at the same time is trying to build up his storytelling capability and a curiosity about the physical science. Cool, this is great. Um, actually, Shu, the next question is for you from Ife. Um, I think this is a great question about how algorithms can help in material science. Uh, so, uh, okay, can I share the screen? Sure, I think you should have uh, um, okay, all right. permission to share, yep. Yeah, so let me show you this, this uh, uh, slide. So here actually has a lot of the geometry, uh, which I'm interested in. 
And so, for example, in this one, as I mentioned, this one is a is a um, is a pyramidal structure, so-called kirigami. It's cutting and folding, to jianzi. So, so having jianzi, right? So you cut, and that's why you can fold. Folding them in particular pyramidal structure, what I didn't show here, is very efficient. They can collect water ten times than a regular uh, mesh people use in the in, in installed in Chile and Brazil. The reason is because the geometry. And so having this kind of geometry, I work with another professor, Paulo Aridia, in the mechanical engineering to understand is how we use this geometry to generate vertex. Uh, so having a vertex is the, uh, the fog can stroll on these surfaces. Uh, although when we, when we introduce the fog, it's a very slow speed, uh, but they can, because of the geometry, they form the vertex and then they actually very efficiently grow these droplets. And then using the, uh, the tilt of these geometry, they can collect it and very efficiently collect the water. So that's one thing. So the question is, how do I design this kind of geometry? I need to use algorithm to guide me to design them. All right, so I need to have a physical science uh, understanding and then using the algorithm to help. Uh, this is another example here, the face. As you can see, we're using the computer graphics all these triangular structures, putting initially 2D structures and, and automatically fold it into the 3D is we're using computer graphics to guide us how do we flatten them out in 2D and then how we go from 2D to 3D. And the third example I, I didn't show here is after robotics. So robot on one hand is very rigid material, but how do I achieve the animal-like locomotion, which is very soft, very agile. So again, we want to use uh, the origami, kirigami, and using the algorithm-driven design and to allow us to interface uh, with everything still hard material, but I can make them very soft so the spine can be twist and then can roll. And so that's where the, the algorithm is very, very important and very useful to guide us design these soft materials or hard materials, making hard materials to be soft. Ooh, thank you, Shu. There's a, a follow-up question by uh, Zhuo Ri. Um, and this is a question about new forms of materials, right? If uh, in research, we come up with new materials, what's the best way to commercialize? Uh, this is, again, another very good question. Uh, so I haven't commercialized anything yet, uh, but I'm very interested in uh, the potential. So I think as a professor, our uh, our um, I think first interest on, is the curiosity. So I'm curious how this will be useful uh, in the real world. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in the translational research, but I'm not doing this kind of things as a, as a scientist. Uh, but when I design new material, as I mentioned earlier, I want to look at what are the potential impacts? Uh, what are the potential impact to the society? And that's where, how, I, how I, I design my research. I think that's very important. Uh, on the other hand is if I have a knowledge, fundamental understanding about how the materials work, and the next thing is for me is can I make them simpler? Can I use a low cost material? Can I use biomass material so, such as I can also address the scalability and sustainability? So that's where I, I see how I, 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 I uh, craft my research. Thank you, Shu. That's, that's a number of really good questions. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? This is your great opportunity to ask anything you want to Jing, Jianbo, and Shu. Um, if there's, uh, Shu, you, you are very popular today. It's a question about digital twins applying to the current research. Uh, I don't think that's my, I think it's probably Jambo's question. <laughs> I, <have no> <laughs> <laughs> I think Jambo's, it's Jambo's, yeah. Well, it's, it's mine, no, that's digital twins, you know. I don't know, it's mine? Uh, I don't know. What is what? digital twin? What is digital twins? That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Let me check. Yeah. Take the time, yeah. I'm learning something on, on, the, on the fly. <laughs> uh, it's a, thing, thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I need to read a little bit, yeah. 
Uh, it's okay. We can take it offline. Mm -hmm. I'm sure all of you know Professor Jen Boshi's email. You can uh, ask him all kinds of uh, great questions. Yeah. So I think we are we are on the hour now. Um, so it's a really good pleasure, great pleasure seeing everyone. Um, so I was uh, in Beijing at PWCC in summer of 2018. I met a lot of students and alums, and I'm sure I'm also I'm very sure. Dean Kumar, Jing, Jian Bo, Shu feel the same way. We hope we can come visit in person sometime very soon. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, Dean Kumar is here. Do you want to say some closing words? I want to thank all of you for joining. Um, what a great panel. I want to thank all the panelists and uh, um, Jambo, we have to create a digital twin for you so that person can answer the questions that you could not answer. Uh, no, but just enjoyed everything. It was just, it was just great. Boon, thank you for organizing it, and a big thanks to uh, PWCC for organizing this event. Um, and hope to see all of you sometime in person in the near future. All right. Thank you, Dean Kumar, and thank you, Jing Jian Bo Shu and PWCC for hosting this. And uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.